All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to the rollout of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Minority Staff Report, The New Big Brother, China and Digital Authoritarianism. I want to first begin by thanking everyone for joining us today over Zoom. It's an oddly fitting way, perhaps, uh, for a report on, on this topic. And let me also thank Senator Menendez for his leadership on this issue and for standing up and fighting every day in the Senate, particularly during these trying times for all the values that we hold dear as Americans. We will begin today with opening remarks from Senator Menendez, the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, on the challenges that China presents both to its own people and to the globe as it seeks to set new and troubling authoritarian standards for the governance of the digital global domain. After Senator Menendez's remarks, I will pass the discussion to our three distinguished panelists who I, who I will introduce when we get to the panel and who will provide their perspectives on China's efforts to develop and expand digital authoritarianism, after which I will engage the audience for a short question and answer period. If you have a question, please use the chat box to send your question to the moderator. I'd encourage you to send questions before we even start the Q&A so that we aren't delayed uh, during our conversation. And without further ado, I am proud to introduce Senator Bob Menendez, my former boss. Uh, and it is no surprise to me that he is engaged in leading the charge on this issue. There really is no one in the Senate who understands better the threat of authoritarian regimes and the risks that they pose to their own people as well to global peace and security. Senator Menendez. Well, thank you, Jody. Thank you for moderating. Thank you for your service. I wanna thank in advance all of our distinguished panelists. We have assembled a very distinguished group of panelists who are going to add dimensions to what we are uh, rolling out today. Uh, I wanna welcome uh, everyone joining uh, for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee's virtual rollout of our latest report, The New Big Brother, China and Digital Authoritarianism. Uh, over the past several years, the People's Republic of China has undertaken a concerted uh, campaign to expand its political, economic, and military influence around the world. Some of this is to be expected. The China of 2020 is not Nixon's China of 1972. The outcomes we wished nearly 50 years of open minds and proactive economic and diplomatic engagement would lead to have not come exactly to fruition. Indeed, the rise of China continues to present new and troubling challenges, both for the Chinese people themselves, the United States and many of our partners and allies and the international community as a whole. Rather than embrace the international order the United States helped build and into which the rest of the world welcomed China, the CCP has instead sought to develop and dominate its own vision of a global order. Through economics, through military antagonism, through predatory financial practices, and through exporting its governing style. One of the increasingly prominent and troubling ways that China is seeking to expand its influence is our topic of discussion today, raising prospects of a global dystopian future dominated by high-tech totalitarian state through China's exploitation of the digital domain and its basic products and services. Over the past decade, we have witnessed China challenge core democratic governing principles by developing and implementing a new suite of technologies and practices that challenge the very nature of an open, secure, and interoperable cyberspace, and by extension, the very fundamentals of a free society. Its leaders seek to create a new model of governance for the digital domain, one that stifles free speech, curtails privacy, and infringes on the basic of human rights that spills over into the analog world of our homes, places of work and worship, that threatens the very notion of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One that threatens the ability of people to have any modicum of privacy, to travel freely or express themselves in a way that runs counter to the official party line. I call this new governance model the use of new and emergent technologies 
in chilling and repressive ways to control the rights, freedoms, and actions of its citizens, digital authoritarianism. And if the United States fails to rally and lead the international community around our core founding principles to respond to the Chinese Communist Party's efforts to create a new big brother, as this administration has so far failed to do, I am deeply concerned about what the future may hold. China's concerted effort to develop, expand, export, and institutionalize digital authoritarianism as the future governance model of the digital domain represents a fundamental political, economic, and security concern for the United States, our allies, and partners in the international community at large. As this report lays out, China is cultivating digital authoritarianism along multiple paths and utilizing its entire policy toolkit including political, economic, diplomatic, and coercive means to shape the digital domain in its desired image. If successful, China and not the United States and other like-minded nations will be writing the future rules of cyberspace. And in a world where people's lives are increasingly dominated by cyber interactions, this threat is growing. Before diving into these various efforts by China to expand its authoritarian governance model beyond China and impose it globally, it is first critically important to parse out what digital authoritarianism is exactly. At the most fundamental level, this report describes digital authoritarianism as the use of information and communication technologies, also known as ICT, products and services to surveil, repress, and manipulate domestic and foreign populations. While the Chinese government party has always relied on surveillance and repression measures, such as limiting free speech, curtailing movement, or spreading false propaganda to ensure its survival, the rapid growth of the internet and other digitally enabled products has unfortunately also brought about a new set of potent tools for the regime to exploit. At home, China uses these digitally enabled products and services to create a unique, omnipresent, and intrusive system of surveillance. China accomplishes this by using cutting edge technologies, including facial recognition technology and big data analytics to track its citizens more quickly and more accurately. Furthermore, China has developed and continues to perfect a vast censorship apparatus that not only limits the types of news and information its citizens can access, but also stifles free expression and political dissent. More recently, China has made a concerted effort to place a legal sheen over its authoritarian practices in cyberspace by passing laws like the 2017 cybersecurity law in an effort to legitimize its practices to its citizens. Furthermore, Although Chinese tech companies claim independence, many enjoy vast backing from the government, allowing them to continue to develop new technologies predicated on authoritarian principles from artificial intelligence or 5G telecommunications. The resulting effect of China's domestic expansion of digital authoritarianism is an ever more politically repressed society, particularly for political dissidents and ethnic minorities. Most tragically, we see the impact of China's digital authoritarianism in places like Xinjiang, autonomous region, which is home to approximately 11 million ethnic Uyghur Muslims, where the CCP has utilized digitally enabled technologies to effectively turn major metropolitan areas into veritable prison cities in attempts to force Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities to become quote, more Chinese. The CCP's repugnant actions against Uyghurs in Xinjiang can only be described as cultural genocide. The United States and our allies have stood up against genocide before, and we must again, using all the levels at our disposal, adapting to confront these new tools. But China's authoritarianism doesn't stop at the water's edge. <coughs> Excuse me. China has been exporting its digital 
authoritarianism and its tools and tactics across the world in a number of ways. The most high profile, of course, has been supporting developing countries' build-outs of their own digital infrastructure, offering new technologies, training and support included, that enable digital authoritarianism. As we more broadly lament democratic backsliding across the world, leaders around the globe are becoming increasingly attracted to China's model of, quote, effective authoritarian governance, whether because of the short-term Chinese monetary benefits or more fundamentally authoritarian leaning leaders see potential benefits of social and political control of imitating China's digital governance model. China's reach is much further than any one country or region. The CCP is even leveraging the international fora like the United States and like-minded Democrats help build to its advantage in the digital space. While the Trump administration continues to denigrate international institutions and exhibit an astounding lack of leadership on the international stage, China is surging to fill the gap at critical intergovernmental bodies, including the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, and other entities that set international standards. Without a concerted effort to stop it, China's digital authoritarianism will shape the future of the digital domain. It is therefore essential that the United States, given our deeply held and cherished commitment to a free society, freedom of expression, freedom of movement and thought, rise to meet the challenge of this new alternative and deeply dangerous governance model for the digital domain. While time is running short, we still have a unique opportunity to help the international community shape the digital domain in ways that support democratic values such as openness, freedom, and the rule of law, including the promotion of human rights. Unfortunately, President Trump has so far squandered this opportunity. At a time when the United States should be reaching out to allies, he is destroying relationships. At a time when the State Department should be leading on global digital governance issues diplomatically, the agency does not have structures or policies in place necessary to counter China. And at a time that we need a clear, streamlined vision for the future of the digital domain, the administration puts forth contradictory and self-defeating agendas. If the United States continues to forego its mission as a leader on digital issues, we will forfeit our ability to shape the digital domain and with it our ability to help secure the future for fundamental democratic freedoms. Consequently, I commissioned my staff on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to conduct this examination of China and digital authoritarianism and to provide recommendations that I believe span the political spectrum, combat the spread of digital authoritarianism, and are vital to the future of a free digital domain. And I want to thank Michael Schiffer uh, and others who were involved uh, uh, in the very essence of helping to create this report. I will not go into all of the report recommendations here, but here are a few key highlights. The creation of a U.S. industry consortium on 5G technologies to compete with Chinese companies. The establishment of a digital rights promotion fund, which will provide grants and investments directly to entities that support the promotion of a free, secure, stable, and open digital domain and fight against the authoritarian use of information and communications technologies. Boosting funding for STEM programs and building a coalition of like-minded allies on critical technology issues. It is imperative that the United States reassert its leadership on digital issues, corral like-minded countries, and ensure the proliferation of digital authoritarianism is curtailed. In authoring this report, it is my hope that it will act as both an informative and propelling document that will push both Democrats and Republicans to collectively engage to address this issue. Now, more than ever, the international community needs the United States to lead on digital issues. Otherwise, the United States 
and the international community at large may see a far different, a far more sinister digital domain down the road. So let me turn the floor over to Jody Herman to moderate a panel of experts. And we thank uh, these incredible individuals with their expertise and insights that have been assembled today to discuss the report, as well as their own thoughts and ideas about the nature of the challenge we face from China's digital authoritarianism. Thank you very much. Senator, thank you so much for those remarks and for your leadership on this critical issue. Countering China in this space must be a bipartisan, bicameral, and government-wide endeavor. We all need to play a part uh, in this critical issue. Uh, thank you so much. I could not be happier that you are taking a, a leadership role on this issue. Uh, so with that, we're now going to turn to our panel. Uh, we have three distinguished speakers this afternoon, and I will introduce them in the order that they will speak. Our first panelist is Xiao Cheng. Xiao is a prominent human rights activist who works as a research scientist at the University of California's Berkeley School of Information and is the founder of China Digital Times. Our second panelist is Libby Liu, the former chief executive officer of the Open Technology Fund and president of Radio Free Asia. I want to thank Ms. Liu for her service at both OTF and RFA, as well as her steadfast work in promoting unbiased democratic values as well as free speech around the globe. And finally, I'm glad to introduce Dr. Andrew Embry. Andrew is currently a senior fellow at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology and previously worked at the State Department's Policy Planning Office. And before that is my colleague on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Xiao. Xiao, you're muted. Thank you, Jody. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your leadership on this issue. I have been engaging in the activism and research uh, against the Chinese uh, digital authoritarianism uh, over two decades. The three things I would like to share and discuss uh, together with this excellent report your staff uh, just uh, written. So talk about new big brother. The, what is the origin of this new digital authoritarianism in China telling us? Um, we cannot help to look into the fundamental need and the model of the Chinese regime, uh, many described as a developmental authoritarian model, maintaining strong centralized power, surveillance state, but essentially, the Chinese regime used combination of legitimacy and control, not just to survive, but also to expand. The legitimacy part, it's the spread of economy, uh, and also fostering the effective governance. On the control part, it's the propaganda, thought control, education indication, uh, institutions, media, um, narrative information space, all of them above, but also depend on the repressive state apparatus, the police, intelligence agencies, secret police, armed forces, and so on. The digital technology somehow helped all of those four aspects of a Chinese state. That's why the China, China's driving the big data, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the digital authoritarian model because it helps the economy, helps their uh, effective governance, but also help their control, both in the information space and in the repressive uh, the surveillance and, and actually the, uh, using the police forces. Now, even more detail at the core is what is a autonomous individual? What is a citizen? consider them capable of thinking, deciding for themselves. But in the digital time, uh, in, in the interactive digital media, games, artificial intelligence, what we see is the environment of collective mimic behavior, the herd behavior. And this herd be behavior, very easy to be prompted by sheer terror or mass fear. 
And this is the environment that Chinese Communist Party establishing its digital authoritarian, even I would say totalitarian order. Why I even using the strong word totalitarian? Because China is not any other country. It's a party state. The party control the state, the state control the society. And it has a single supreme determination, which is own perpetuation. And this party state requires ideology. And China actually had one, which is, this is beyond Mao Zedong. This is the Xi Jinping era. This is what we, he called China dream. If I describe what China dream is in the Chinese official language, the propaganda language, and that is the uh, national greatness and individual happiness, the one and the same and the inseparable. That is that there's no individual happiness without national greatness. In Xi Jinping's language, that's a rejuvenization of the Chinese civilization, which is China at the center of the world with an empire. In that kind of logic, so the, this unity of nation and a person actually is a fascist idea because it reject the enlightenment of the modernity of the, it's eliminate, it's, 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 it's diminish the individual autonomy, can lead to war. But this danger of the totalitarianism is not only just for security, but for the fundamental value of human dignity. That's at the core is mm -hmm. what this competition is about. At the core is the rival between the digital authoritarianism and liberal democracy is really about. So once again, I want to thank Senator for your leadership on this issue. And I think the United States should lead, taking the leadership of the entire world, especially all the democracies, to enter this 21st century's epic battle for human dignity. Thank you. Libby? Hi, um, thank you to Senator for um, doing this great work. Um, I personally have tried to do a landscape of the Chinese digital authoritarianism model myself and found it uh, way too big of a task. So um, kudos to uh, Michael Schiffer and your team for doing this great report because it's, it's utterly essential as you point out, the time is of the essence. Um, a few thoughts, and like Xiao, I've been fighting the uh, Chinese firewall for about 20 years now, and um, have learned a few things, um, not the least of which is much of the external expansion of their authoritarian model is driven through you know, a very central and strategic um, initiative, broadly known as the United Front. But um, United Front aside, you know, just briefly, you know, three decades ago, the Chinese government was um, investing money and giving resources to the African continent in exchange for um, mineral futures. Um, two decades ago, they did it in Latin America. In the last decade, they have been investing in uh, MENA and also Eastern Europe to a great extent. And all of this has been happening under um, a world order that has been based since World War II on values that Center Shaw points out on human dignity. Now, how can humans have any dignity if they are robbed of their individuality and their basic human rights? Um, the one thing, the one area that I would add to the um, analysis that your team has done is uh, the next thing, which we do a really good job at looking at the expansion of uh, CCP surveillance and censorship technologies. Um, we released a report last November um, that tracked uh, these technologies to 110 countries around the world. And that was only in November, it's probably like, I don't know, 200 by now. Um, that as you uh, address that includes not just the hardware, the software, the training, they'll give you personnel, all of this 
together. This is a problem in so much as the alternative world order of authoritarianism versus freedom and democracy. But what's the get for China? You know, there is more. And one of my biggest concerns, and I think a huge priority, is data mining. Um, we think of it, you know, just in the, as an afterthought, right? Um, TikTok censors a woman putting her makeup on by talking about the Xinjiang camps. To do that, it means they have access to all the data regarding her. So whenever they exercise um, the censorship and the surveillance and you know the um, blockages of people using the technologies that the Chinese government has financially backed, um, underneath that action is an entire world of data that is all being vacuumed into an authoritarian government who is determined to create a social credit system. And in their accumulation of our personal data, because we choose to use these apps, because we live in a free society, that exposes all of our countries to the same kind of manipulation and offline uh, retaliation for online behavior. I mean, just recently, uh, the Hong Kong national security law astonished everybody by basically saying, if anyone in the world criticizes China, they're violating our national security law and we'll prosecute them. Here in the mainland where we have rule of law, not so much. But what that does in a world that is filled with Chinese technology is really compromises security of everyone. So backing up, I want to thank you for um, supporting the full authorized funding of the Open Technology Fund. We at the OTF focus on the individual. We are the frontline defenders for people against authoritarianism, surveillance, censorship, manipulation, um, privacy invasion, all of those things that happen to humans on the ground is what OTS does. And so we um, have an entire ecosystem built to incorporate developers, activists, and journalists and at-risk users in a hundred or more countries at any given time. And when we look at the CCP authoritarianism, it is literally the testing ground because they are so sophisticated. So we have um, to um, work, you know, to add to this data mining situation. When we did um, uh, security code audits of these mandatory apps that are in China, like example, uh, study the great nation which has 495 million downloads in China we see that the code inside these apps have super user remote access and they also have data vacuuming capabilities they search your device and harvest everything about you everything you say everything you do who you talk to all of that goes into these massive computing services in the mainland. So this is a more disturbing piece. I agree that the highest priority for us um, as the United States is to build up our alliances with people that share our values because the CCP has been very effective in dividing and conquering the like-minded democracies that we, you know, um, live in and that we support. So I think it's absolutely essential that an organization such as the Open Technology Fund is allowed to continue to operate because it we do things at the speed of technology. Give you an example. Um, the CCP passed a bunch of laws and basically tries to hold everybody accountable for any disturbing speech or commentary or criticism that they have. So um, they basically shut down 
blocked websites and everything. Then everybody inside the firewall decided that you needed VPNs to get out. And we saw this just recently in Hong Kong, right? Right before the national security law hit, everybody downloaded VPNs. Well, the Chinese figured that out too. In April of last year, there was a study that found that half of the top 100 VPNs in the world were already compromised by China. So then OTF funds WireGuard. WireGuard is a VPN, secure VPN code, which is super lightweight and uses cutting edge security. And right now, um, it's going to impact 96% of the top 1 million websites around the world and make it impossible for the CCP and other authoritarians to um, exploit vulnerabilities in VPN technology. So the majority of the world trusts VPNs to get them outside of repressive societies. What we need to do is make sure those VPNs are safe. Um, you know, in so many other ways, the Open Technology Fund is just pushing the envelope. We supported CertBot with Let's Encrypt, and that has encrypted 225 million websites around the world. I mean, think about the magnitude of the impact. Just obviously the signal secure protocol has more than 2 billion users. Um, that's a low estimate, but it's not just funding a bunch of projects. It's an ecosystem where we are building capacity in countries where the problems and the at-risk communities live. Um, in just our digital internet, um, safety fellowship, we have affected more than 200 organizations in the global south to help protect themselves. Who is going to protect the people? Uh, we have a multi-tier challenge. It is first and not most important that we have leadership from people that share our values and human dignity for all. But Below that, there are so many other tiers of work that have to be done so that people are not arrested for using Lantern. Or, you know, somebody in Australia is not being called by the security police with her dad sitting next to him saying, what you've done on Twitter is illegal in this country. Come on back so we can put you in prison. This must work in tandem. And I'm sorry that I ran on. Um, one last thought is a huge concern of mine is the normalization of surveillance that has happened since COVID. I know the report was written pre-COVID, but you know I am enormously concerned about Western democracies even normalizing surveillance technology in addition to my earlier concern, which was on convenience technology. So um, I'll stop there, but this authoritarianism is everywhere in the world and we have got to protect the people. It's, it's not just our way of life. There is no way of life if freedom is taken from people. Libby, thank you for putting that in, in very real terms and describing the scope and, and the spectrum of issues that we need to that we need to address and that we need to address really very quickly. Andrew, uh, your turn. All right. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Terrific. Uh, well, I want to thank Senator Menendez and his team, particularly Michael Schiffer uh, and Danny Ricchetti for their leadership on this report. Uh, and for the opportunity to share a few thoughts. And I'm delighted to be here with Shao and Libby who bring a great deal of expertise to this topic. I am pleased the report emphasizes bipartisanship uh, because Congress has an absolutely critical role to play on this issue. And one of the issues that deserves bipartisanship more than ever is a key recommendation in the report, which is building a coalition of like-minded partners on critical technology issues. And that's what I'd like to say a few words about. I want to talk a little bit about the stakes, the purposes our alliances serve, and then how we can apply our alliances to meet the China challenge. The argument I want to leave with all of you is that in addition to comprehensive national strategies at home to stimulate competition on everything from 5G and AI 
uh, to a host of other technologies. We need comprehensive democratic strategies uh, that go beyond the bilateral to leverage the ingenuity and strengths of our broad network of allies and partners. America's allies are more than just unique assets on this issue, they're asymmetric ones. And I wanna say a few words about that. You know, as research from the Alliance for Securing Democracies, Georgetown, CNAS, and other organizations have shown, the information domain is an asymmetric space. And I think China and Russia have been quick to realize this and have devised strategies of influence to undermine democratic societies and to sow divisions among them. I think we need to rethink how we leverage our alliances to meet this challenge. And too often, we put China and the intensifying U.S.-China relationship at the center of our alliances, which can polarize and divide them. What we need to do is put our alliances at the center of our China policy. So how do we do that? I think that starts with an understanding of the purposes that our alliances serve today in a competitive environment. Now, the functions of an alliance have evolved over time and changed, but four really stand out to me. The first is that an alliance is critical for aggregating capabilities to deter conflict and to practice forward defense. Alliances are a means of reassurance and influence. They're an instrument of restraint and legitimacy. And finally, they can serve as a platform for creating and shaping zones of stability, all of which are key. So how do we apply these to meet the China challenge? I see four big challenges right now. The first, uh, as the report notes in chilling detail and as the other panelists have noted, China is using digital tools not just as a surrogate for physical repression, but as a handmaiden of physical repression. Historically, the greatest challenge for autocracies has been how to exert control over ever larger spaces without choking off the innovative potential of their economies. And China has found a way to apply digital tools to accomplish critical tasks. It's trying to use them to monitor its population, discern their preferences, uh, stifle protest and social mobilization, co-opt elites. Uh, and these are all deeply concerning trends. But to implement this, China has relied on computing power and hardware solutions, on technology transfer, uh, on investments from companies abroad, uh, and, and assertive across a lot of standard setting organizations. And I think we can use the function of an alliance as an aggregator of capability to meet this challenge. We can work with our allies to apply targeted and multilateral export controls on semiconductor manufacturing equipment, which is a key node in the supply chain. We can work with our allies to coordinate visa screening and investment screening procedures. So we benefit from the investments and the foreign talent that are critical to innovation while also protecting our research e ecosystems. I think we need to work with allies to devise a rule set for companies a risk-based compliance framework to make sure that they aren't contributing hardware solutions to China's surveillance state. And we can work with our allies across a whole host of standard setting organizations to make sure that democratic values are at the absolute center. A second challenge, as Senator Menendez in the report notes, is that China isn't just building a digital authoritarianism at home, it's also exporting it around the world. And that means that fragile democracies really are on the front lines. I think by one estimate, uh, you know, more than 80 countries uh, implement Chinese public security and surveillance platforms. So this is a huge challenge. But as research by Dr. Sheena Greitens and others have shown, there are complex drivers for this. China has geopolitical clout, it has a large market, but there are many countries that implement this technology to meet domestic needs in a cost-effective way. So democracies have to come together and provide a reasonable cost-effective alternative that puts democratic values at the absolute center. Many of these countries have interests and aspirations of their own, they have agency, so we need to have nuanced strategies to figure out how to provide that alternative. I think the report's recommendation for a digital infrastructure corporation is very important. I would add that the corporation, it's a key that it has surge funding, it focuses on priority countries, and that it coordinates strategy across the digital stack, across the interagency, and with our allies and partners, and puts issues like privacy, privacy enhancing technologies at the absolute center. I think a third challenge brings us closer to home, which is that we're obviously in a contest of models, which means that we need to provide a clear contrast and an alternative. And that's where alliances as an instrument of restraint and legitimacy are so important. I think COVID has been a forcing function for change. And one of the changes we've seen is a ramping up of surveillance for public health issues. And I think we have to make sure that this doesn't sanitize or legitimize 
uh, egregious abuses of surveillance. So we have to make sure that at home we're managing uh, AI and big data responsibly and in consonant with democratic values. And we have to make sure that democratic surveillance, surveillance has the right safeguards. We need to make sure that data isn't combined so that it, you can de-anonymize it. Uh, make sure that civil society is involved and that there's transparency and accountability. We have to make sure that we're putting forward a democratic way of AI on the home front. Uh, and finally, I would say a challenge that often comes up uh, and Deputy Secretary Bill Burns, former Deputy Secretary, has brought this up, that we tend to try to shape the internal trajectory of China. But I think where we have real leverage is to try to shape the environment into which it rises, which means we need to mobilize a coalition of countries to give China constraints and choices. And some of that is going to involve defensive measures on our part, whether that's protecting core technology, some of it will involve more assertive measures, whether it's on digital authoritarianism or on protecting democratic values and standards. Some will require us to distinguish between vital interests and secondary interests and to make sure we don't overreact. And at other times, we'll have to pursue pragmatic cooperation when it meets our interests with China, such as on pandemic preparedness and response, climate change, and AI safety and security. You know, I'm confident that the United States can meet this challenge. The technocratic and technological authoritarian governance model is a real challenge to address, but it's also an opportunity to revitalize the liberal democratic project. I think we have fateful choices ahead, but if we don't go it alone and work with our allies and partners, I'm confident we'll make the right choices uh, and meet this challenge with clarity of purpose and resolve. So thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, and really, thanks to all of you for your for your comments. Uh, as Zhao stated, this is really an epic battle that will determine who will write the digital rules and whether or not China is able to deploy its authoritarian technology, not just in China, but globally. So we do have uh, some time for questions. If you uh, would like to ask a question, please go ahead and uh, put that uh, put that question uh, in the chat um, so that I can so that I can see them. And as folks are doing that, I just want to ask one, uh, I'll take my prerogative and ask this one question at the top here, which is I want, I want to take a look at some of the recommendations that the report has made. Andrew uh, alluded to, to a few of them, but I'm curious for your reactions on, on, on just a couple of them. One has to do with U.S. investment uh, in developing and deploying 5G technology. Like how does our engagement, how does our spending uh, compare uh, with that of the CCP, um, and you know, what should that look like? Is it a federal effort? Is it a public-private sector effort? And the second question I have is around this really novel idea of creating a federal cyber service academy. It would be similar to our military service academies. And I think the underlying question there is whether or not we are currently producing the cyber talent that we need and if we are, if what we are producing, is it available to us in the way that we need it? Is it available, for example, to the U.S. government um, for, it, for its needs, or is it largely being utilized by, by private sector firms? So let's start there, and then I will quickly uh, move to, uh, uh, to take questions from our audience. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say a word about the 5G. Uh, I think that this is going to have to be a multifaceted effort. You know, it's one of those uh, points where we need to think about not just China, but we need to focus on us and our competitiveness and what we need to do. So whether that's a flexible spectrum strategies, uh, promoting a, an open interface, open architecture for 5G, uh, making sure that we're linking arms with allies so that we're collaborating with them, trying to stay at the, at the leading edge. So it's 5G, it's making sure that we have public-private partnerships on this, but also thinking about 6G, uh, and also trying to, to learn from what our allies are doing. Uh, you know, Nokia has been taking some interesting steps recently. And so this is an absolutely critical area, and it's an area where it requires a foresight on our part uh, but also leveraging our unique innovation ecosystem. You know, we don't have to mimic China's model of, of innovation. We have our own creative bottom-up uh, system that can produce real, uh, real advances if we have the right R&D behind it, the right talent, and the right infrastructure. So it's not just about ramping up money, it's about doing it in the right way so it's tied to a concrete end goal and strategy that leverages cities and states, universities, industry and philanthropy. So I think we have a strong hand to play, uh, to play it wisely in the years ahead. 
Thanks, Andrew. Anybody else want to speak to that issue, or should I move on to the next question? I, well, I can I, say a word. Um, sorry, maybe. Okay. I, I agree that absolutely we do need as a nation to take leadership and invest in our technology. I think that um, taking a free for all, I mean, it, uh, attitude has been great because uh, our country is so full of entrepreneurs and innovative and brilliant minds, but that can only take you so far um, if capitalism or commercial you know, viability is your end goal. Um, we as a nation have an investment in the end goal, which is protecting people and their freedoms and democracies. And as such, I do think that our country needs to take um, action in private public partnerships and investments in any way helping the people who are um, involved in the technology to have an environment that they can grow in. Um, and I mean, that's basically what the CCP does, right? They underwrite these technologies. So it makes sense that that's an advantage over what our system does. Yeah. Chow? Oh, I just want to simply say that uh, these are uh, critical technologies, particularly come to the artificial intelligence, uh, 5G. Uh, it's vital for uh, national security as well. Um, therefore, uh, the U.S. should uh, produce its own talents, uh, not simply uh, uh, relies on the commercial world or the marketing provides. Uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, the talents, the data, the algorithm are the three things vital in this technology world. Um, Chinese uh, authoritarian state has actually the advantage to um, uh, access to the data uh, to across uh, um, the the uh, different aspect uh, uh, social realm to uh, integrate the data for their own training their own algorithm and artificial intelligence, but in the talents part, uh, until now U.S. and China are very cross that many of the talents are Chinese studying in the United States and working in the United States and many of the Chinese uh, uh, high tech companies are actually and stock, stock market uh, in the United States, et cetera. Uh, but with this uh, uh, technology becoming more and more uh, vital in the national interest, the national security area, uh, U.S. should have its own academy uh, producing its trustworthy talents. All right, so I have a question from CNN. This is the question. It says, TikTok does not appear to be specifically mentioned in the report, but some of the recommendations do seem like they would apply to the app. Would you recommend some sort of TikTok ban as has been floated by the administration? And if so, why or why not? Uh, do you agree with, with this idea? Although I suppose it could apply to other similar apps. TikTok is the one that's you know, at issue at the moment. Um, I can take that um, since you know we do so much work in, um, you know, reverse engineering these apps to see what are the vulnerabilities that are built into them. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, all of these um, technologies, and especially TikTok, which, as I mentioned before, whenever you have an example of the company doing Chinese censorship, you know, censorship of anything critical of China, then that means they have all the data on TikTok. So, to the extent that you want a foreign adversarial government to have access to the data of all of our young people in this country and in our fellow um, democracies, I think absolutely we have to be a lot more uh, restrictive. And that's not, you know, I, I don't, I'm not against capitalism or, you know, competition or anything like that, but the adversary is working in an insidious way. We have to realize what their mindset is. And that has been, I think, to our detriment. So, so we, can you just expand on that a little bit for people who, you know, understand the controversy around TikTok, but maybe don't actually uh, understand why it's so problematic, right? It's just a fun little app. You can go on and even parents can do little dances uh, with their kids, like what is it? What is it that is being collected that we should be concerned about either for now or for for some time in the future? Well, um, so in 
November last year, um, the Washington Post did a story called Inside TikTok, and um, it revealed that a set of internal company guidelines published in the Guardian newspaper in September instructed the TikTok mod moderators to ban any videos and topics in line with Chinese government censorship policies, including distortion of historical events such as the Tiananmen Square incident and um, criticism and attack of the country's policies or social rules, including the socialism system and discussion of highly controversial topics, which the rules include independence of Tibet and Taiwan. So um, what I'm talking about when I caution um, about our open door policy to let anyone in our country use hardware or software that's been created by an adversarial supported um, company is that in order to comply with the Chinese government's rules and demands that TikTok must capture all the metadata on everybody on it. So um, a more even concerning aspect is the possibility and probability as we've seen in some of our app audits that um, they put um, malicious software code into it that will then harvest your contacts. So then through that, they can reach everybody in your contacts. So I'm always telling my parents, because they left in 1949 as you know refugees of the Chinese Communist Revolution, but they still feel like they can visit China don't know why, but I tell them I cannot open any of your emails or messages from China because hmm. they have compromised your device. And through that, they can compromise anybody or in your contacts. People have to think about the larger um, underlying layer here. Um, and as Xiao mentioned, all of this data feeds their AI. So as they perfect artificial intelligence and its ability to mimic or even co-opt actual humans, then I think that this is a huge problem. Um, and giving them an inside um, avenue to get to our teenagers and our, you know, college age students is disastrous yeah. in my view. Uh, Jody, maybe I just say a word about TikTok. Um, sure. it, it's a form of social media, right? So we are living in the world era of the social media, digital media, meaning Facebook, uh, uh, Gmail, Google, what, the, the Twitters, YouTube, everything. TikTok is one of those things. All social media are surveillance tools. They collect our data, the user data. Yeah. They, they collect what we search, they collect what we publish, they collect what we commented on, and they collect on um, even frequency of what we type as keyboards. And those data feeds their algorithms to target individually profiling those users and for to manipulate them. But in the uh, de democratic world, like um, uh, which has a strong privacy laws, uh, the those surveillance um, so apparatus to collect our personal behavior data being used to make money on us uh, by but in authoritarian state that also being used to control their citizens or spy on the other uh, uh, citizens in other countries because China as a state they have a law. The, the, the national intelligence law, that the companies cannot say no to the state to hand over any of the data. Therefore, if we don't trust the Chinese party state, then you cannot trust your data in the hands of Chinese companies. As simple as that. Can so I, should, I think to get back to the question real quickly, should, should the United States take the action of banning apps like TikTok or, or the, will there just be another app that pops up in its wake that, such that you would be playing whack-a-mole? I think it, um, my personal opinion is it would be whack-a-mole. Um, what we have to have is a better um, analysis and research and um, clearance. We have to have better um, mechanisms for 
guarding what happens. And as Shao said, you know, the, the difference between Facebook and TikTok is commercial interest versus authoritarian control because the thing that we're not talking about is that the ultimate goal of you know authoritarianism is social engineering and the use of ai um, to learn how to change a person's view and character is really what's at stake here um i found a, a fun um thing that i had done for a pre prior talk this is an example of a um, hong kong protest on TikTok. Um, you can see that, you know, here it was um, in the US. And then 24 hours later, this is what came up for Hong Kong protests. Can you guys see that? It's gone from like all kinds of Hong Kong protest stuff to nothing. Um, yeah. So it's just an illustration. So we have maybe, um, we have maybe about 10 minutes. So I want to, I want to, I'm going to give you guys a couple of questions. And I want to pick up kind of where you just left off, uh, Libby, um, which is about um, kind of the Chinese authoritarian surveillance state. So uh, we do have a question specifically on that about the new Chinese national security law in Hong Kong um, and how that's especially affecting issues around surveillance and censorship in Hong Kong. But I, I have a broader question tied to that, which is whether or not China's actions recently in Tibet, Xinjiang, and Hong Kong whether or not those are a bit, have turned out to be a bit of an Achilles heel for China as it seeks to sell its authoritarian model to other states. So that's one question. And then the second question, equally small question, is about China's uh, social credit system uh, and whether or not it's using that credit system to apply pressure to international companies to suppress free speech of their employees and how American companies can avoid being accidentally used or, or intentionally used as proxies for China's surveillance, for Chinese surveillance and censorship. So one question around the, the credit system and another question around uh, this issue of the new security law in Hong Kong, but also Chinese actions in Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, and Hong Kong, and how, how that affects what China's doing, and, and frankly, whether or not it's affecting their ability to, to export their, their technology and their governance model. I think that Xiao Chang is the best person to answer the question of whether Xi Jinping has um, overstepped, uh, because you know we uh, frequently chat about that. Um, the second question, um, can you rephrase again? So basically, uh, whether how are international companies affected oh, by yeah. the corporate oh social credit system, and what can they do? to prevent themselves from being used by the Chinese in this way? I'm so glad you asked this question um, because it is a no-win situation. Um, there was recently a very, very good blog post um, directed at non-Chinese companies that want to do business in China and went through an entire analysis about you know, all the steps that you can take to try to protect your corporate data, but not and um it's the conclusion of the blog is basically there is no way because the chinese bank software is written so it will only run on a chinese version of a windows operating system moreover it'll only run on an outdated unpatched unsupported version of windows <laughs> and the reason is that because the malware there they've hidden in their software depends on exploits from these old versions so I would say um, strongly nobody can protect themselves if they're going to do business with China. Um, Xiao, about Xi Jinping overstepping? Well, I, I think the, the recent very uh, uh, blunt and act on the national, uh, Hong Kong uh, national security law um, and other um, uh, sort of Chinese uh, state actions, um, it's an expression of fear uh, uh, that, that it's, it's a fundamental insecurity of the Chinese uh, uh, state under uh, Xi Jinping and, and CCP, that they were afraid that Hong Kong, they losing Hong Kong's population support, which they, 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 uh, that afraid is valid. Uh, uh, um, 
they uh, think of six million people that was on the street to uh, 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 last year in demonstration. Um, but the reaction is more repression. Yeah, uh, even uh, uh, you know, uh, toss out the uh, their international promise and everything. The this actually has huge consequences uh, uh, internationally. Now we're already seeing the uh, uh, reaction from the United States and from the United Kingdom, but it still helps the legitimacy of the Xi Jinping's ruling inside of China by galvanizing these uh, nationalistic uh, support. Um, so it is a very uh, a concerning situation. In terms of the, the social credit system and uh, in international business, um, you know, social credit system is not only just for international business, it's for Chinese business, and particularly for, it's, it's aimed for Chinese individuals, citizens, everybody. Uh, it has not fully rolled out yet. All these data are not quite uh, uh, consolidating together yet, but state has that mass, master plan. Um, under that kind of system, that every individual, they're being measured by those numbers through those different data, uh, your health data, your social uh, behavior data, your personal behavior data, and your uh, monetary or financial data, etc. If you put them all together, it's a very powerful tool to control and to nudge uh, uh, citizens' behavior. And also put further put individual into such atomized situation. Like, it's, it's not like the workers has a union or, or, or the, the, the people has a different, uh, different status. Now you're everybody just judging by a number. And, and, and that data is being collected from your daily behaviors. Uh, make the person very difficult to connect with others collectively to bargaining against that kind of power. But for international business, for foreign business, maybe you can because that foreign business is on one class alone. They are not entirely subject to uh, 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 the, the Chinese government role. Therefore, they may collectively bargaining, negotiating, and demanding some kind of space in that kind of control. Hanford? I'll just, yeah, just a few comments to, to jump in on some of the thoughts that have already been relayed. The first is that I think so a point of emphasis is that it's not just the surveillance technology and the export of it that's concerning. It's the laws, norms, and practices that are embedded in those technologies and that are spreading around the world. So I, I just think that's a point of focus and concern that the democratic countries need to pay attention to. Another is that when we look at the uh, domestic laws that China's passing, again, it's not just the laws, it's also the standards embedded in those laws uh, that can expose source codes and encryption keys. And so that's, that's a separate challenge. I think in the question of overreaching that you asked earlier, I, I do think in Chinese strategic concepts, there is a tendency to link internal and external security issues. And given what we've seen recently, uh, cyber attacks uh, against Australia, uh, you know, the events in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, uh, and then its mass diplomacy, we've seen overreaching on China's part, and I think that will uh, inhibit sort of the, the appeal of its model, but it also puts an emphasis on the United States making sure that we're working with our democratic allies to present a clear contrast and an alternative. And this is why I think it's so important to get beyond the bilateral context, just US and China, and think about our allies, just one statistic on R&D alone, the U.S. and its allies comprise almost two-thirds of global R&D. That's a tremendous pool that we can work with together to try to innovate more collaboratively, uh, to get beyond just using data for, for uh, machine learning systems, to think about alternatives like one-shot learning, to put our values forward with privacy-enhancing technologies. So there's a whole host of things that we can do to make our, our model more attractive. And I think that's going to be even more important in the years to come. All right, so unfortunately, um, I think that is um, all the time that we have. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Zhao, Libby, and Andrew for your, for your comments today. And of course, uh, for Senator Menendez for hosting uh, this event. Uh, if anybody has not yet received or read a copy of the report, it's available for download on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee website. 
And if you have any other questions, you may reach out to Danny Rachetti or Michael Schiffer, uh, who are staff on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But mostly, thank you for joining us and thank you for your taking time out of your day to, to like really think about this issue and, uh, and, and the solutions that are you know, at hand or, or we, can, we can make at hand, if you will, uh, in the coming years to address, um, to address, this, to this, address this issue and make sure that um, we know who's making the laws uh, when it comes to uh, our digital futures. So with that, thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a lovely afternoon.